liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Thursday, and that's all you need to know. What else do I have to tell you? It's Thursday, June 2nd, 2022. Okay, a bunch of twos in there. If you uh, need to retire at some point in your life, you might consider going to play the lottery with some twos in it. I don't know if you can win quite enough to uh, make it anymore. You know, you got to have at least a billion, two billion dollars in savings, I think, these days in order to uh, have uh, any chance of keeping your head above water. As from what I'm reading in the financial press, at any rate, uh, you got to be able to start a hedge fund in your retirement. There's no retiring. Even even rich people, I guess, don't retire. All right. Well, at any rate, never mind all of that hopelessness. The Kegger in the Morning Radio Show is live now, and that's all that matters for the moment. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bill says, all the way in Portland, Maine, where I am, it's going to be 55 today. Where Kegro X is, that's that's me, yeah, it's going to be 95. This is not possible because we're both on the East Coast. Somebody make sense of this trickery. Hmm, yeah, this happens a lot these days. It's awfully hot here in Virginia. We live in, like, apparently, the Sahara Desert, and it went immediately from uh, 60s, 70s springtime to 95 summer, as it always does here. It's very, very short, um, temperate period in the spring uh it warms up slow and you start wondering when we're going to be able to get rid of the uh the spring jackets and have warm weather and then it goes straight to blazing hot so okay uh par for the course i guess in that uh, in that sense but not terribly comfortable anyway maybe i should head on up to maine where it'll be a cooler 55 there's plenty to do plenty to catch up on it turns out there's still a pandemic. I found that out today. I've been keeping an eye on it, you know, trying to keep track of things. Number-wise, yeah, you know, things are <laughs> continue to creep up and uh, surprise us all. But uh, let's see, where's my? Uh, I haven't looked. I haven't found my usual morning New York Times coronavirus tracker. Ah, there it is. All I need to do is look. And uh, we can lead with a little bit of a story on that as well. But uh, it, numbers continue to fall, so that's good. Down to 191 on average. Uh, but I do think uh, the holiday weekend will take its toll on those rolling seven-day averages. Because contrary to that good news, The Guardian reports this morning, I guess, yes, we're playing with fire, which is probably accounts for why it's so hot here. U.S. COVID cases may be... 30 times higher than reported. That seems like an awfully large factor uh, by which to have missed. Greg Dworkin has a collection of stories for us to share. And of course, uh, I do have to note, as I did in the morning post, that we are once again under the, uh, well, I wish it was shadier, but certainly dark cloud of mass shooting again by technical definitions. I mean, we've gotten to the point now where um, of course, there's something that qualifies. They're going to have to update the definition of a mass shooting because a regular mass shooting just doesn't get very much interest anymore. It hardly registers on the news as more than a blip. A shooting at a uh, on a hospital campus, I guess they're now calling them campuses, uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which left four people dead plus the shooter. I guess that's the new interesting journalistic practice now as they count the shooter out separately when they are killed or kill themselves during one of these things. Uh, but yes, uh, the truth of the matter is that we have an awful lot of these things and it's uh, water off our back these days because, oh, well, if we really paid attention to every time, every single time more than four people were shot and called it a mass shooting, why we'd get the impression that we were drowning in gun violence in this country, and you don't want to have that. But the truth is, uh, that is the case, and uh, as it turns out, uh, there are plenty uh, more of them. You can always check in with gunviolencearchive.org to find out exactly how many, and if you do click on that uh, at any given time, you'll be probably surprised to find just how often 
this happen. So perhaps we'll click on that later on. Greg Dworkin is here. Uh, and I, I have heard reports that he's been here 30 times longer than we previously believed. So good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. Uh, 30 times more boring than you thought. <laughs> oh, well, oh, no. Well, we're in for it. Uh, we need it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, the, the yeah. Tulsa thing is a little weird uh, uh, yes, because, it yes, it was a shooting. And by the way, uh, the idea that you count the people in the school but not the shooter certainly goes back to at least Sandy Hook. Where mm-hmm. everybody yeah. in Newtown knows there were 26 people uh, killed at the Sandy Hook school. The 27th was the gunman's mother, who we killed before yeah, uh, right. going to shoot, uh, eerily reminiscent of what happened, uh, you know, in, in Uvalde. Mm-hmm. And the 28th was the gunman. But he is never counted, and his mother is usually not counted. Yeah. And, and uh, that's just, you know, the way it is. So the number is 26. So that doesn't surprise me. The, no, the Tulsa thing new, really sounds like somebody who was going after a specific person. Yeah. And then there was, as the military likes to call it, collateral damage. And the reason I say that is that this is a piece from The Independent. Mm-hmm. And they're independent. Uh, and uh, Therefore and good. they say, this is the story, quote, staff and patients rushed from the Natalie Medical Building and others took shelter during the attack, which came only eight days after the mass shooting at an elementary school in Uvalde. One man who escaped the Tulsa hospital with his wife told reporters the gunman, who has not been identified, told them he was not there for him. Uh, That's why okay. the police think he was after somebody specific. Oh, not you. Yeah. Tulsa but, police have described know, the shooting as very specific anyway. with the suspect having a very specific purpose, but they haven't released what that is. Mm-hmm. So it just, you know, if if you get uh, caught in a gang related crossfire or somebody's out to murder a particular person for whatever reason and then other people are shot, it feels different than a completely random. I was in church. I was in the grocery. I was, uh, you know, at school. And it shouldn't. I mean, you know, dead is dead, shot is shot, but it does feel different. Yeah, uh, that's what accounts for it. And I guess that's what would account for. uh, Plus, as we as I said, I mean, as crazy as it is, uh, the number of people who are shot uh, uh, has something to do with the definition. I guess the FBI has their definition. Uh, I'm sorry. Also, whether the kids remember, you you always pick out specific stories and say, this is a one day story, then we'll forget about it. Yeah. Uh, and Tulsa is going to be a relatively short lived one. It shouldn't be, but it is in the context of all the others. Whereas uh, Buffalo uh, is something that's going to be remembered. And Uvalde is absolutely something going to be sure. remembered the way Sandy Hook was. So the stories, you know, hit you differently. They but, do. you know, it's a mass shooting by definition. Right. And that's people the are dead need to talk and about. you can't fix that. And lives have been wrecked and it's horrible. And yeah, you know, that shouldn't be overlooked. And in case you're wondering how easy it is to overlook it, with a num- with a mass shooting definition, apparently is four people, other than the I guess other than the gunman, have to be shot, and they don't, you know, as it happens, definitionally. I know it's very cold to talk about it this way. They 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 just need to if they're injured but don't die, look, you're still shot. That's a shooting. So by that definition, four or more people shot. There have uh, this is how easy it is to overlook it. How how frequently are people shot in this country? There have been twenty since Uvalde that are listed here at the Gun Violence Archive, and not exactly ringing out historically. Uh, oh, and of course, if I told you, well, that time that four people were shot in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, you would say, I don't even know, like what time <laughs> are you talking about? Forget what day. Well, you know, but this is this is the Buddha looking at these things, right? Yes. Well, how many were shot? Well, were they all killed? Well, does it count? Well, uh, this was shot later. This one was shot by the cops trying to come in. Mm -hmm. So does that count? And the Buddha says, uh, these are horrible incidents and people are dead. Yeah. I mean, uh, just to give you, again. Dude, don't lose lose sight of what's going on here. What kind of numbers we're talking about. There have been two in Philly since Uvalde. And Philly's not the only place. Chicago, of course, uh, never long between incidents of gun violence, they also have had to, and for people who say, well, sure, Philadelphia and Chicago. Well, you know, talk to the people in Stanwood, Michigan, Anniston, Alabama, uh, that small town Memphis, Tennessee, Colorado Springs. The other way that people uh, tend to, to, you know, uh, handle this, you have to handle this any way that that keeps your, you know, mental health uh, in, in running condition. 
and sometimes, uh, you know, New York City sarcasm and, uh, uh-huh. uh, you know, uh, I- irony, if you will, uh, wow. is the way to do this. And so Twitter reacted with, oh, I see what happened in Tulsa. Obviously, they have a door problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how can you how can you pass that up, given how ridiculous another the- door problem? Yeah. I wonder if there is a site somewhere which lists the number of door issues mm. we have over the past month so we could see just how many door problems there really are. It yeah. just, you know, highlights how stupid the response from Republicans has you been. Sure and I don't think that door one is going to last very long. I hope not. They really tried to go all in on it, but uh, they have doors everywhere, and, and that's what leads to lists like these, I guess, according to their logic, where, again, uh, people who think, well, sure, Philadelphia, yeah, sure, uh, Chicago. I mean, explain Taft, Oklahoma. Explain Henderson, Nevada. Explain Chattanooga, Waco. Benton Harbor, Michigan. I don't know. It's just uh, maybe there are too many guns and too many hands. Possibly. Yeah, well, the other side of the coin, of course, is Four if uh, hospitals and schools yes. and churches aren't safe, then maybe we should do something. Yes, and I'm sure that the uh, Republicans have an answer for that. Close them all and well, just thoughts have and private... thoughts and prayers. Yeah, there's also that, right? It's homeschool and also home hospital yourself. As well. Go ahead. Why not? We'll give everybody vouchers to perform their own surgery. Right. And also home churches. Stop going to church. Yeah, right. Obviously, they're not safe. So, you know, what you have to do is you have to do everything at home. Yeah. Well, no doors for you. Yeah. Well, you talk about lockdown. Yeah. We right? hate lockdowns. You shouldn't do it for a <laughs> pandemic. But we don't mind, uh, you know, Doing uh, it for, barricading yeah. ourselves in our homes, home school, home hospital, home church, home everything, you know, but uh the reason we need all those guns is to barricade ourselves. So you just proved my point. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay well, fine. gosh. How, how about, uh, you know, how about you go do that in that little isolated shack over there that nobody will go near and the rest of us will go live our lives. You take all the guns with you. Some of these shootings, I think it could have worked out that way. I don't know where some of these towns are. Hmm. So uh, let's talk about John Durham a little either. more. Cause okay. I think that there's interesting flopped. stuff there. Yeah. You're both from Connecticut. So... Is that yeah, enough, really. Uh, That's all and, there is. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, I don't know. There is much similarity there. No. Yeah, interestingly, uh, Bill Barr eh? thought Durham did a great face plan. Yeah. He applauded the face plan. Barr applauds Durham for pushing MAGA narrative after pro flames out. As David Frum uh, uh, points out, watch the video for the excuse Barr embeds hmm. at uh, 33 seconds for collapse of the Durham prosecution. Quote. While he didn't succeed in obtaining a conviction from a D.C. jury, yeah. a lot of facts been there on the D.C. Hmm. Okay. Is, uh, when we say San Francisco values, that's code. <laughs> is yes. D.C. jury code? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it probably is. Uh, you know, urban. Urban? You know what that means. Uh, non-rural white? Yeah. I mean, that could be I mean, be what it. was he saying? What, what is he trying to say here? I, I don't know. Which He's a DC guy. I mean, he didn't obtain a conviction, period. But okay, from a DC jury, I don't know why that would be important, but okay. Well, you have to explain why uh, Durham didn't go anywhere. You know, we explained yesterday. Hmm. I mean, and, and the whole point here, <laughs> uh, Philip Bump had a good column about this. Oh. And his his uh, title, what if, the headline, and bear with me here, he <laughs> says, what if John Durham doesn't have the goods? <laughs> Yeah, and that was before we found out that he didn't. Although right, we, the last time heard. anybody saw them, the goalposts were about three miles due west of Iowa, having been dragged <laughs> their foot by painful foot from their original position just outside of Barr's Justice Department. Ah, D.C. Since Trump first DC sought, so, so these are Iowa values now, since Donald Trump first sought to undermine the investigation into whether any members of his 2016 campaign had knowledge of or work with Russia's effort, hmm. The goalposts have been in motion. Over and over, he and his allies presented some alternate explanation for the investigation that shifted all of the questions about legality and ethics onto his real and perceived opponents. Maybe what the media should really be looking at was unmasking Michael Flynn when we talked about that Uh yesterday. Or the Peter Strzok text messages or the Carter Page warrant or the dossier from Christopher Steele or the machinations of Hillary Clinton's competing campaign. Yeah, Uh, You know, you, know, you, you left out a bunch there, I'm sure. 
Uh, in each of these endlessly elevated cases, the strategy was the same. Take something legitimately iffy or easy to perceive as iffy and reassemble the Russia, Russia probe on top of it. That the real triggers for the investigation change so much is pretty robust evidence that they weren't the real triggers at all. Hmm. Right? The, the yes. reason that Trump's team in Russia were being investigated is because Trump's team was involved with Russia. Right. That's and that's why Paul be. Manafort was convicted. I mean, that's all you need to know. Money and... Carter Page, you want to throw that into? Fine. Well, how he was picked up is the issue. No, what he did is the issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was illegitimate to be outlining all these bodies in chalk. What kind of nonsense is it? You know how dangerous chalk is. You hear from Susan Collins. Yeah. It's practically murder itself. You, you can't start a murder investigation by drawing on the sidewalk with chalk. Well, who we knows where we go? There. Look into it, it. It's only there, then you go to marijuana and then to heroin. <laughs> right. Or maybe just straight to heroin, yeah. honestly. You, these six year old but kids out there with Chuck, it. you got to watch them like a hawk. It was supposed to drop Tuesday right, morning sorry. bump rights for months. Durham seemingly been building toward an argument that Clinton's campaign bears central responsibility for the emergence of the Russian investigation after indicting an attorney who worked for a firm hired by Clinton on charges that he lied to the FBI. And we went over that in detail yesterday. He didn't lie, and that was the only thing they had. Durham released little tidbits about what he and his team had learned, which could be interpreted to suggest that he was building a case not against Russia, but against uh, not against the probe, hmm. but against Clinton. Dun, dun. Is, the whole thing is a locker up thing. Yeah, that's where they were hoping to go. But right, uh, what Durham's team hoped to prove was that Sussman had misled the FBI about working for Clinton, but instead of proving the first significant reinforcement of the conspiracy theory that the Russia probe was downstream of Clinton's efforts, the jury found that Durham didn't prove his case at all. So, I mean, he did a bad job as a prosecuting attorney. Right. So uh, someone picked up Liz Power reports uh, something Fox had said. Fox, the last hour before Sussman was found not guilty, quote, an acquittal in the Sussman trial could raise doubts about the legal merits of Durham's entire investigation. Why, yes, someone should investigate the then, legal underpinnings. Then <laughs> Fox, this hour after Sussman was found not guilty, the jury was rigged. Another black eye for our justice system. Uh -huh. So it's a great example of moving the goalposts. Way past yes. Iowa, all the way to Idaho. I think what they meant was it's another black guy for the justice <laughs> Yeah, it's probably system. what they said, right? Right. You just uh, misinterpreted it. Yeah. So uh, here's the point. It seems clear based on Barr's public comments that he's skeptical of how the Russia probe began, which is certainly his right. It seems clear that Durham was tasked with proving the skepticism correct. So it's great when you go in there trying to prove something rather than just do an investigation. Yeah, usually. Uh, just but that's OK. No you know, case. sometimes it has to be pointed in that direction because, uh, well, yeah, you know, I mean, there, there's there's but, the uh, Sherlock Holmes. Let's find out who killed the guy. And then there's the well, let's prove you are the killer, which is usually the clownish uh, uh, plot, as they like to call them in, yeah. in uh, British uh, drama, yeah. uh, who uh, comes to a conclusion right away and the wrong conclusion. And it's up to Holmes and others to prove that guy wrong. So it also seems clear that Durham was tasked with proving that skepticism correct, and that effort isn't going well. For those orbiting Trump, it doesn't matter. The investigation sure. itself is simply to say the point was proved because, look, there was an investigation. Right. And, and in fact, grave, Durham's lose, probe has become rigged. everything Trump and his allies accused Mueller of doing. Yes. A, fishing expo a fishing exposition that's gone on too far. So if he fails and he was appointed by... Uh, Bill Barr, who's clearly a political happen. I don't understand why anybody treats him as a serious person. Mm, right? He's maybe. he's at least as much, if not more, of a political hack than Kavanaugh. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, given that that's the case, you know, the question is what happens next? If Barr, the political hack, appointed Durham to come to a conclusion that Barr wanted him to come to, why doesn't his successor just fire him? Okay. And he could. Obviously, he there would now. be political I mean, issues, but there were political issues when this guy was uh, originally, uh, you know, appointed. Yes, that's On true. the other hand, though, oh, he's got more. one more case, and it may be really? that Merrick Garland is waiting for this other case to drop. Maybe, I guess. I don't know. Maybe. 
I, it's it's funny how often we're finding that well Merrick Garland isn't pressing forward with one case or another and the and the reason is well the case is just not strong enough we don't think we can make the case in court and and here we are hopping out of the way of this guy who can't make his cases in court oh well you know if we fire him before he makes his other case that he can't make in court it'll look political well you know you well, could say giant and it will failure be you're fired but, you know sometimes you got to do politics in order to get yeah, here yeah i mean come still, on still i i think it's worthwhile in that context to uh, uh go over uh, and armando brought us uh, uh, to this uh piece that empty wheel had written okay. a while back about what's really going on with this other case well fine. so i think that's worth we'll uh out. mentioning is a guy named ivan uh, danchenko <laughs> Okay, everyone's talking about Ivan. Nobody's talking about him, but Nobody's you know that's the Ivan. only other thing that uh, Durham has. Okay. Oh, okay. Igor. And and uh, the thing is, uh, you got to define some terms here. All right. All right. First of all, which one? Uh, well, FISA, in case anybody yes. had right, forgotten. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, which is uh, how uh, the U.S. sets rules about monitoring foreign. Uh, uh, surveillance. Yes. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Is Classic. what it's called, right? Yeah, right? And then there's another one called SIPA. SIPA. The Classified Information Procedures Act. Let's say you, as a foreign agent, me, were ensnared by my picking up conversations you had with, well, I don't know, the Clinton campaign, let's say. That sounds about like uh, trying to uh, uh, somehow involve their uh uh charity oh yes with extra money uh sneaking in from the saudis sure and we picked it up okay okay and so uh that's uh uh, maybe you talk to somebody at the uh, clinton charity so we want to money unmask the person you spoke to Uh and there were rules for that Okay. And, uh, you know, in order to monitor that, you have to go to FISA court and uh, see if you can monitor the American who you were talking to. Yes. And those are the rules. And that's what FISA comes up as when it involves an American, if I got that right. Something, I guess, probably like it. Who knows at this point? And that's how Carter right. Page, an American, yeah. wound up uh, being surveilled. OK. All right. So let's say he you, as the, the person who got picked so. up, uh, you know, uh is going to be sued over what you did. Probably. Or if we can't get you for what you did, maybe when we asked you about it, you said, nah, I didn't do that. And so you lied to me. So we're going to sue you for lying. Okay. Because that's often what happens. You know, you can't get uh, Capone for murder, but you can get him on tax evasion. Right. I don't know what you did. You did the murder so well, I can't find the weapon, but you lied to me about where you were. And so I'm going to sue you for that. Okay, sure. So you go a different route. Right. So you... As the defendant say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean you're going to do that? I have discovery. I have the right to find out what you're using in order to uh, properly do a defense. All right. And uh, so you say to me, well, you know, give me everything you got that uh, I can use in my defense that is relevant to this case. Sure. And I say to you, hey, you can't have it. It's classified. Ah, good trick. And you say, yeah, but there's a way around that. It's called the Classified Information Procedure Act, or SEPA. Hardly ever invoked, but uh, the rules are, when it is invoked, that uh, you have to redact the stuff that's truly, uh, uh, you know, sensitive and -hmm. give me the rest. And there's a procedure for that. And it goes to a judge and the judge decides what needs to be redacted and what doesn't need to be redacted and whether certain words can be substituted for other words so that you don't give oh. away what's going on. If uh, I found out about this because I had a CIA front company, you get to substitute the name of the company for some other name so you can never figure out yeah. what's the company Amazon. that's really the CIA. That'll be my... You know, that sort of thing. Okay. And Marcy Wheeler uh, detailed all of this because it came up in the Scooter Libby case. Ah, Okay. So there were clear examples of when and how this happened. So there is a procedure for this. But the point is, this guy uh, uh, that uh, uh, Durham is thinking of going after, Danchenko, is a foreign national. Okay. So if he invokes 
SIPA, the Classified Information Procedures Act, and says, you have to give me your classified information so I can prepare a defense, hmm. then uh, the Russia? agencies who's classified the uh, information are saying, wait a minute, you want me, John Durham, on a completely made-up pretext to give classified information to a foreign national? That seems what are you, to be crazy? What we're trying to prevent. Why yeah. would I want to do that? Okay. And Durham would then have to explain to the judge who's making these determinations, well, because uh, there's this conspiracy theory that somehow or other you're involved with the 2016 election, and the judge can look at it and say, you're nuts. That's oh, not going anywhere. Right. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And if that happens, no case. And if there's no case, Durham's got nothing else. I mean, that, that's why the details huh. here are so important. Okay. It's very difficult to see, and this is what Marcy's writing about. It's hard to see how this is going to actually wind up in court mm. because you have to go through all these complicated procedures, which include turning over redacted, classified, and perhaps sensitive information to a foreign national for the purpose of – explain to me what you're trying to do here. Not Did this guy sure. hurt the CIA? Was he leaking secrets of the NSA? Was he doing something that was in somehow uh, some broad context detrimental to the United States? Was he one of these whistleblowers that, that uh, uh, revealed state secrets? No. You're doing this as a political vendetta and you want us to cooperate? What are you, crazy? That doesn't sound like a very – hopeful prospect uh maybe we ought to have an investigation why is john durham so intent on turning over classified information to russian agents we ought to look into that uh, maybe into six seven eight years of his background everything he ever said to the fbi surely there's a lie in there somewhere right uh, and you can okay. you know the details of what he did don't really matter i guess not Right. The question is, why is he even doing this? Uh, right. Well, I guess at this point, uh, another paycheck. But really, get a job, dude. All right. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or... Even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. And send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything. But if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right. Well, we are back now. Welcome back, everybody. We've been discussing the case in the meantime. Trying to, you know, it's it's not entirely clear. I guess. Uh, well, I've been wondering. Well, here's here's a Washington Post uh, story. You want to know Danchenko. why Igor Danchenko's name yes, even comes why? up? This is from uh, November why? 20, 2021. Devin Barrett is pretty good reporter. Tom Jackman. I Igor Danchenko arrested, charged with lying to the FBI about information in the Steele dossier. Oh. An analyst who is a primary source for a 2016 dossier Maybe. of allegations against Donald Trump has been arrested on charges he repeatedly lied to the FBI about where and how he got his information. So Steele puts this dossier together. Yes, they're very mad about that. And, they're mad, and, and uh, they want to know where Steele got his information. And, uh, you know, this is one of the primary people who was giving I see. information to Steele. Right. And so the FBI goes and asks him about it and said, where did you get your information? Yeah, and he and lies. apparently he lies about that to the FBI. So that's that's the problem for Danchenko. Okay, is that like huge? Well, in Trump world, it is. I guess. I mean, it would it would mean something to Trump supporters to find the name of the guy and a conviction of the guy, the guy who lied to Steele, such that Steele would write this dossier. I'm sure that's at the heart of what they believe. But but what's interesting is, of course, the whole thing was Christopher Steele is a liar. He's he lied. He made up all this stuff in the dossier. And then they they tried that. And then and no, he, I didn't lie. 
at at best, I was told a lie by someone else. All right. Well, well so that, now they're the looking thing. for Remember, that guy. Remember, you know, part of the problem with the other Durham case, Sussman, yeah. is that they were trying to make the case that the FBI was in cahoots with the Clinton yeah, administration right. trying to gin everything up. And it turns out that uh, even in the indictment and what they had to present in court, because when you go to court, you actually have to present evidence, not just make stuff up. Uh, the FBI was the uh, victim, not the villain. The okay. FBI didn't know that Michael Sussman, uh, you know, was lying to them. And only after they found out that Sussman was lying to them did Durham bring this uh, charge. Yeah. So you couldn't paint, even in Durham's fevered imagination, you couldn't paint the FBI as the perpetrators. They were, in fact, the victim. And here in this indictment, also brought by Durham, the indictment also suggests Danchenko may have lied to Steele and others about where he was getting the information. Yeah, maybe. So it's hard to make Christopher Steele, I'm intentionally doing this on behalf of the Clinton campaign, when in fact he himself was being lied to by Danchenko. Right. Of course, yeah. In their minds, they'll say, well, you, know, you should have known that he was lying to you. And I don't know how, but, uh, well, you're a spy. You're supposed to be able to figure these things out. Well, yes, maybe. And at, at worst, then I didn't, I, I got fooled and there's no way you can convict me of that. And, and so it happens to be the case. They can't, there's nothing on him. So, yeah. So they're looking for, well, who lied to you? And, uh, you know, I, 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 the guy could come to court and say, I'm a Russian agent. Of course I lied right. to him. So, so is the information or he may say, no, in the Steele dossier correct or not? That's we have no idea from this because, remember, he's not being arrested because yeah. you wrote things in the Steele dossier that aren't true. That's not why he's being arrested. Right. He was well, indicted yes. and arrested because he lied to the FBI about where he got his information. <laughs> I mean, I, right. I just want to make the, it. It seems yeah. like a small point, but it's a huge point. Right. See, the I fact guess. that the guy was arrested proves the Steele dossier was. No, it doesn't, actually. First of all. You are only arrested because you lied about where you got your information. Not this is not a trial about whether or not the information is true or not true. Mm, One of the things right. in the other trial yes, that too. the judge was very clear to state to the jury, this is not a rehashing of the 2016 election. Oh, you have oh, a no. small piece of uh, question in front of you to answer. Did Michael Sussman lie to the FBI or not based on the evidence? That yeah. alone and nothing else. So it could be as uh, the situation so could one. essentially be. Right. OK. So, Igor, what did you tell Steele? I told him was P-tape. All right. Uh, and there wasn't. Well, as it turns out, probably no. Who told yeah. you about the P-tape? Did P -tape? I know? I didn't know. Not Putin. Who knew? You know, oh, you say it wasn't Putin. Well, I think that's a lie. It might have been Putin. So, you know, you might at the end say, well, we didn't, you know, he... he he, he said it wasn't Putin, but it was. So jail. And now what? That's if you win the case. If you lose the case, as is most likely to be the outcome, uh, maybe because of the, you know, the paucity of evidence about it. Uh, at best, you come out and say, well, he said it wasn't Putin and we couldn't prove that it was Putin and therefore he lied. There's a lot of people who aren't Putin. I don't know. I guess See, the whole thing smells yeah. fishy. I right. told you all along. <laughs> we have to get to the bottom it. of it. Who yes, is but, not? But no, you haven't gotten to the bottom of anything. And in fact, it may never even come to trial. Because uh, yeah, I mean, in order for Danchenko to defend himself, he needs classified information. And yeah. the agencies who have this information are not likely to wish to turn it over right. to somebody like Durham on such a flimsy reason that has nothing whatsoever to do with uh, national security. Yeah, not to mention that, uh, well, what are you going to do? I trust you, Durham. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to give it to Igor Danchenko, who may or and may not Fox be getting News. his information from Putin. Oh, okay. Great. I'll be and, redacting and Fox that. News. And Fox News. So, you know, the the two people, uh, and I'll give it to, uh, I know, I'll give it to uh, Russia today. Mm, yes. Because I'm sure they'll carry it if they uh, ask me for an interview. Yeah. All right. Well, then you can get it. At least you can get it printed. Yeah, there's no way it'll get it to foreign hands. I'll be very careful with it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Oh, I'll also give it to Paul Manafort. Oh, yeah, he'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. Putin. Okay. Well, that's so. That's it. That's what's at the heart of what John Durham is still doing. Right. And so, you know, it's mustache. such a bad case, but it's such a political case. I can understand why Merrick Garland would have a hard time firing him right now until this thing gets some resolution. Maybe, but I wonder. 
<laughs> I, I know we all want him to do stuff and we think he should do stuff and he's not doing it. I get that. Yeah. But I could but I can understand why he's a little hesitant with this I, one. I mean, I guess so. Although you could say like, eh, you know, the truth is no one's going to notice. No one can even tell you what the case is about. Well, I think you should do it anyway. Case. I think you should say, OK, Darren, no. you had your chance. It was really stupid what you did and nobody believed it. And uh, D.C. jury or not, I think that uh, an Iowa to Idaho goalpost uh, jury would still have done the same thing. So forget it. You're out. Bye. Yeah. Sure, why not? And we have to do this to preserve the integrity of special prosecutors, because this guy mm. is giving special prosecute, prosecutors just as bad a name as Ken Starr did. And we can't go through that again. Yeah. We have to well, be like oh, real no. clear about what we're doing. It this time? Okay. Well, it's a little late for that, too. All we right, need, well, we'll we need well, Ron Jaworski. You know, if we're going to do a special prosecutor, we got to do it the way we did it with Nixon and Watergate, not the way we did it with Clinton. Okay. Well, maybe too late. But maybe, but you know, he could, John you know, Durham needs a boat. He's so. the boss. He can do whatever he wants. He can fire him. Okay. There you go, Merrick. Uh, and a, uh, related to Trump, uh, May circumstance here. We yeah. have, uh, Hugo Lowell reporting, uh, in, uh, the guardian. He covers, uh, congressional matters and has been very Hugo. into the January 6th coverage. Ah. Trump lawyer, Kenneth Cheeseboro said <laughs> in 13 December, 2020 memo to Rudy Giuliani. Yes. That right Vice President this. Pence should recuse himself from running the electoral count mm, yes. and hand the gavel to a senior GOP senator like Lindsey Graham. Oh, he chose Graham for that. That's interesting. Okay. Recall that Senator Grassley said on January 5th he didn't expect Pence to preside. Yes. Okay. So the There's argument here basically that. is that since Mike Pence was involved in the election yeah. and lost... Right. Like Al Gore. Okay. Allegedly. Yes. Uh, that uh, Congress can't by statute impose duties on the vice president beyond those set out in the Constitution. <laughs> so what? Yes. And even if the Congress okay. can mandate that a vice president must preside, Pence should take the position that he should not and cannot preside because he has a conflict of interest because he was involved in the election. Hmm. Um, that's, uh, well, I was going to say it's a new one, but I read somewhere in the memo that apparently, uh, some vice president in the past had done the same, although they weren't trying to rig the outcome of the election in their favor. They thought it was just a conflict of interest. But of course, we all, all remember pretty well Al Gore presiding over the electoral college vote count in which he was involved as, as the presidential candidate and he didn't recuse. Uh, so I don't know. I'm not certain what they were trying to get there, but I, I guess that they were thinking at the time. I don't know whether that was an indication that they knew that Pence wasn't going to do what they wanted or it, this was just window dressing or they thought, let's have somebody we know will do what we want. Well, this is mid-December, so they couldn't have known what yeah, uh, Pence ultimately would decide. That. But I think they were trying to shield him from the controversy that they must have anticipated would arise from right. their stupid what if, what plot. If, what if Pence won't do it? Well, then this. Yeah. Or, or, you know, or what if Pence is willing to do it? Shouldn't we shield him from it so that it doesn't look like he installs himself as vice president? Why don't we have Lindsey Graham? I don't know where Lindsey Graham came from, but uh, Grassley or somebody else. Why don't we make them do the dirty work? And then our clean vice president Pence Right. Uh, so the memo goes on to say concerned. President Pro Tem acts as the president of the Senate. So regardless of whether it's Grassley or another senior Republican, whoever it is, proceeds to open the count and they do Alabama first, at which point Trump and Pence are leading 12 to zero. Ooh. And the point there is uh, they mention Stop Grassley the and Grassley is the one who said, no, I'll be doing it. Yeah. And no. so that raises a couple of questions. It does. It, it, it seems to indicate that Grassley is aware of their plans because there's really was no reason to believe that Pence wouldn't be in the chair. Although I did see somebody point out that I guess Grassley never says it directly or he's he's quoted in the papers as saying this. But apparently there's some question as to whether he was misquoted it, and it, there's a real possibility no here. he was quoted because the quote is quote we don't expect him to be there yeah <laughs> right uh the question is where's there uh I, i've seen the question ar arise about whether uh grassley was talking about presiding in the senate after the joint session dissolves to go back and consider whether or not to accept the alternative slates of electors 
or whether he means presiding in the joint session in Pence's stead. Which Buddha is, says when you're planning yeah. an insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's 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 a real the question, details. <laughs> but you know, okay. So at, at best, though, Grassley is able to say, no, 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 I meant this other thing. Okay, well, you were never really a central player in, in what we were after anyway. We're really after Trump. I mean, if we net you along the way, great. But uh, it's not that important. But the rest of the memo focuses, again, on uh, just like John Eastman. It's a, it's a plot to come up with a way to declare everything is so confusing that we should just leave Trump But as, as part president. of the plot, were you discussing this with people like Grassley? Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's the question that leads back to Trump that makes uh, yeah, Grassley an unindicted right. co-conspirator. It, it, it could. And then we'd have to find out, okay, well, let me see. Where, who were you talking to? What was the question that you were asking? Let me see your answer and we'll see whether your explanation makes sense. It might not. Yeah. As part of this scheme, John Eastman spoke to Senator A. Yeah. Uh, uh, as a part of the scheme to uh, sit in if Pence couldn't be there and just yeah, leave it at that. Right. You know, unindicted it, conspiracy. It. it doesn't name names, but it's pretty clear what's going on. Why from the not? Reading. Give it a try. Uh, I'd love to find out. And uh, this plan, I've read the memo or at least parts of the memo. And uh, this plan, like Eastman's, leaves out, again, the same major part of the mechanics of getting this done. Neither plan has a provision for getting the fake electoral certificates. And they both hinge on having at least the confusion of having two certificates presented. The part where you were reading, they read Alabama and Alaska, and then he's leading 12 to 0, and then uh, as Arizona comes up next. And then the plan calls for the vice president or whoever's there in his stead being handed two sets of certificates for Arizona, scratching their head and saying, golly, I don't know what to do. Therefore, if we're going to figure this out, we got to break up the joint session. Everybody go back and decide which of these two certificates to honor. The The problem that both Eastman and uh, Cheeseboro have is nobody explains how they're going to get the fake documents onto the floor. And it's a huge hole uh, because the doc, the real documents are mailed from the state capitol to, well, among other places, the vice president or the president of the Senate. But v Mike Pence and every other vice president of the Senate, they don't open their own mail. They don't process it. They don't carry it to the floor. You remember all the people that uh, we made a big deal out of being big heroes. And, you know, they, they, they were great they, in service to their country and did their job, the ones who hustled the electoral college certificates off the Senate floor on January 6th. And everybody said, well, they saved everything by by protecting the electoral college certificates from the from the mob. Uh, questionable about whether or not they had to do that, but they did do that. They felt that was their job. Would those people, this all depends on those people getting a fake electoral certificate from Arizona when they know who won Arizona and saying, eh, I should put it in this box and hand it to the vice president in front of everybody on C-SPAN. They're not going to do that. They're not mm. going to do that. So there's no point at which Pence or anybody else is handed competing certificates unless there's reason in the mail room and in the secretary of the Senate and the clerk of the House in those offices to say, yeah, I really don't know who won Arizona. We should just give them both to the vice president and let whatever happens happen. Well, unless the Senate votes to look at those other things. I mean, look at part, what? Where are part they? of this whole scheme is to talk to senators and try to get them to yeah. come aboard with the scheme and somehow or other bring it to a vote where they can get their. Right. Uh, right. You know, I mean, they could make fake, up anything. Uh, fake certificates uh, entered into the record. Yeah. But there needs to be some discussion about it. Like, does Ted Cruz pull something out of his pocket and say, I don't know how they ended up here, but I have the electoral certificates from Arizona. Well, maybe what? when they invaded and uh, they insurrected yes. and they went to his desk and they found his notes and they found stuff nah, in it he didn't like. That did happen. Uh, maybe uh, maybe he was saying, I don't know how you get the certificate to the floor. I just don't yeah. see a way where it could actually happen. Oh, he's not really one of us. He's right. a traitor. I, I don't know. So I'm not certain how they think that that was going to get there. I mean, and then Arizona, too. Like, well, I mean, Ted I don't know Cruz, that, why do you have responsible it? not to speculate. I, it's it's a fun thought. I mean, the whole thing, they're intricate, intricately involved in every single detail, except the part about I can't get the 
things past the mailroom? How do we? Well, how do we? You do saw that? You, you know that very uh, famous science cartoon. Right. Yes, science. The scientist with Which the beard one? standing at the chalkboard, and he's got all these uh, uh, differential equations. And then in the middle of the board, it says uh, dot, 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 and then a miracle occurred, dot, <laughs> dot, dot. And then at the end, the conclusion he wants. And yeah. the other scientist looks and said, I think that middle part might need some work. Right. I mean, that's really it. Or uh, the kids say, or the, the kids who are now, uh, you know, 30 and working in your office say it's the underpants gnome theory. Or perhaps, I don't know, I'm not certain whether it makes sense to say the Chewbacca defense, but I guess anything that makes anything makes sense in, in that context. But yeah, this is the part that puzzles me is I really, I, I know, and everybody thinks that's minor, but uh, the, it jumps right to Pence's handed two certificates. How? Why? No one's going to give him that certificate unless, I mean, they could arrange for somebody. I have somebody on the inside in the mail room and they're going to slip it into the box. That is why, in my view, among many reasons, yes. it's so important that Doug Mastriano lose the ah. Pennsylvania governorship. Okay. Because, uh, as you're pointing out, the whole flaw in the uh, argument is that you have to have some way of introducing these fake yes, certificates. Yes, but what if it's point. done at home before it even gets to Congress? Yeah, I mean... That's it's, the that's what the Republicans have realized. Eastman's scheme has a flaw right. in it. It's got that. And then a miracle occur. Why don't we make the miracle occur that's at right. home? That's it. Why don't we completely redo the the rules? We mm -hmm. put in our own secretary of state because in Pennsylvania, the governor gets to appoint it. And we, as Politico puts it, it's going to be an army. Tapes reveal GOP plan to contest elections. How do you do that? Not poll watchers, but the actual poll workers, you know, those delightful people who sit there for hours and hours and hours on election day, who hand you the ballot and, uh, you know, do all the work, who, mm -hmm. who you always think of as League yes. of Women Voters volunteers. <laughs> uh, they used to what, be. what if they're all Republican operatives like Bill Barr? Mm. And the, the scheme is, OK, so if they see anything they don't like, like a black voter voting in a white district, ah, they call the Republican gotcha. Party lawyers. To contest that ballot, yeah, and that's a that's like a comparatively at the grassroots level, at the lowest it. possible, uh, you know, point in the chain of command. What if they do it that way in order to get their fake uh, electors certified by the state? Then they send it in, and Eastman's scheme can't fail because now you have a way of introducing it. Hmm. Yeah, well, it, that's a great point because it's not it isn't the case that. Two competing certificates have never made it to the floor because there's a foolproof system where there has been genuine controversy and there has in the past been genuine controversy. Then the decision is made. We got to have both of these certificates go and the, the joint session is going to have to decide what to do with them. And in this case, of course, they had already called the election. Everybody had figured out who won and wh who won which states, and there was no lack of information. So when a fake certificate shows up from Arizona, the clerks are not going to put it in the box. But if in the future, um, you know, the rules by which they are supposed to determine which one is a real certificate are abused, like Doug Mastriano wins the gubernatorial election in Pennsylvania, appoints his own secretary of state, and they both say, look, the rules that Congress has to follow in 2024 under the current Electoral Count Act say you count the certificate that bears the signature of the secretary of state and governor. Right. And there's been so many and issues brought up at the local level, and I can document them here. Yeah. Or even if they I'm, can't. I'm going to do it differently than what you thought was going to happen. Yeah. I mean, whether they can document it or not, if the rules say you, the, the tie goes to the one that has the governor and secretary of state signature on it, and they just say, I'm signing the wrong one, and I know it. I'm doing it. What are you going to do about it? Then, you know, God I know at that point, it. though, there, I think the clerks would say, all right, in this case, I am sending both certificates. The rules say this is the real badge. one, but we all know this one I don't need no is. stinking badge. Yeah. So, I don't know. But, this is, yeah, where they were lacking in this one was an ability to get the floor clerks to go along with the plan and hand, you know, the whole thing. They build up this dramatic moment. And at that point... Arizona is called and he's handed two certificates. No, he's not. That would have been hilarious to watch if they hand, and Pence is like, you're going to get two certificates, they tell you. 
Mr. Vice President. And then you say this, and then he gets handed one certificate and goes, ha, ah, num, <laughs> I don't know what to do. I, I, this says Biden won, but I say he didn't. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, that would have been really interesting to watch that whole thing fall apart and then to have people say, Cheeseboro, you idiot. You forgot to give him the certificate. I can't believe it. Mm. Why don't we have a special prosecutor and let them spend three years investigating you? Right. Okay. Now, having gone through how complicated the schemes the Republicans come up with in order to steal elections, and they're quite real. This isn't conspiracy theory. Uh, you know, this There's is you know, documented there. stuff that they're doing. It's the doing. second memo about this we've read already. Yeah. Um, it's interesting how voters react to life. Uh, I'll yes. change the subject a little bit, but I just want to throw this in before the end of the show. Uh, Sarah Longwell <laughs> yes. over at uh, uh, the Bulwark is, is a pollster and often does focus groups of Trump voters and others. And and this particular uh, podcast she did was about Trump voters, and you can hear it in their own voices, mm-hmm. Trump voters in Florida. All right. Sure. Great. I would not do that podcast. Okay, well, you know, she's a Republican and a conservative and a never Trump. Oh, right. Yeah. So she's going to do that. Okay. So so she's going to do that. Okay. And she asked about, uh, given what happened in Buffalo and especially in Uvalde, uh, how do you feel about the uh, gun safety laws? Oh, And these are Trump voters in Florida. Oh, interesting. Every one of them was in favor of over 21 uh, laws to obtain a gun. Okay. Raise the age. Every single one of them. Every well, you know, one of them Trump said was in favor of banning assault rifles. Oh, this is pretty amazing good. stuff. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is now sometimes we don't listen to them, right? your base that you're trying to do this for actually can see through some of the crap and say, you know what? Mm. No. Well, Trump himself Split had unarmed said that teachers, once. assuming it was voluntary. Some are for it. Some are not. Oh. But nobody thought teachers should be mandated to carry guns. OK, well, they're still in no mandate mode. And they, they couldn't agree on the doors. Whether we should have that, them or that's not. the funny part. Everybody's <laughs> in favor of over 21. You got to be over 21 to obtain a gun. That's actually yeah. becoming a pretty popular thing. Well, it wouldn't. What about the 22 and 23 year olds? I, Greg Dworkin, say make it 25. But uh-huh. everybody's in favor of banning assault Six rifles. Minutes. Well, how do you define it? I don't care. Just ban them. Yeah. But I'm not sure about the doors. Right. Uh, the, they're still trying to figure out whether or not uh, that hasn't been around long enough for them. Yeah. To maybe they just don't know what they're talking about. Trump. Had you know, what are you talking about with doors? doors? You got to have doors. Know. Yeah. Uh, that what, you're saying not have a door in the door or having a door that doesn't open? What's the point? It's a door. I, door. I don't get it. What are you saying? Garage door. So I, I can understand why that's split. But that's you know, funny. Everyone in favor of raising the age to buy a gun. Everyone well, in yeah. favor of banning assault rifles. That one even that one surprises me a little bit too. Trump has said in the past that he thought that they should raise the age, so they have a pass on that. If if that's what defines what they think is okay, but I don't believe Trump has ever said yes to banning assault rifles. Although uh, maybe he got close enough that when he was saying, "Oh well, maybe we should do something about these the bump stocks." Although people forgot about those. Right. In 2019, there was yeah. a poll. Aaron Goldman, who's a, a data journalist, the point says 68 percent in Florida support requiring individuals to be 21 plus to buy a gun. All right. Uh, the assault weapons ban was 40 percent at that point. So, again, focus groups don't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, reflect the greater mm-hmm. uh, group at large. That's always the problem with focus groups. But they're always interesting. And I just thought it's pretty interesting that you got unanimity. You got more unanimity for raising the age and for banning assault weapons than you did for those door things. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a, uh, from a Quinnipiac poll in, in 2019. Should you be to buy a diner in Florida if you wanted to control these focus groups? Right. But, you know, still interesting stuff. And, and you know, part of that to me is why it's uh, never appropriate to say there's nothing we can do and nothing will ever change. Hmm. Okay. Nobody would have predicted. Who could have predicted? Not not even the Bush administration could have predicted hmm. that uh, Trump voters would say that in Florida. Okay. That's, I guess so. That caught me by surprise, and I guess probably even them. How interesting. Right. Okay. So, uh, cool. <laughs> somebody asked, well, what part of Florida? Well, the Florida part of Florida. <laughs> hmm. the, Trump, the Trump voter part of Florida. Hmm. That's most of it, I think, but... 
Okay. Well, that is, well, who knew? Uh, I'm glad. Maybe they should follow up on everybody should go to this diner. And yeah. Report uh, like that. shooting kids changes things. You know, does it change things to the point where you actually have meaningful mm-hmm. things that are uh, enacted? I can't say that. That's not what I'm saying at all. But there's always that opportunity, and you have to go for the opportunity instead of yeah. throwing your hands up and say, oh, we can't do anything. Right. And that's the reason why the Republicans immediately say, well, don't politicize it. And they, it's because right. they realize, oh, if right. you or do, whatever you, you might just win. suggest that that won't make a difference in this one case over here. Well, yeah. it would have over there. Yeah, but not over this one. Yeah, but over here. Well, but it's not going to make a difference in all of them. Well, no one thing will make a difference in all of them unless you take them away. Take mm-hmm. them away. Oh, there's an idea. Why don't we just ban them all together? The oh, you can't do it. that. People in a diner say you can. Well, you so, know, uh, take even, your word for even it. back in 2019, 40% of Floridians say you can. Hmm. Yeah. I'll build well, on that is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, yeah. How do you get to a majority? Well, you start with 40 and then you add 10. Uh, yes, that's right. As a matter of fact, that's exactly it. Uh, just don't make it Joe Manchin's job to find the 10. Yeah, and don't call uh, a Quinnipiac and say, listen, I just need you to find me another 11%. <laughs> right, and don't fake Quinnipiac poll results either. We found that out uh, the other day. I'm just weird saying. Weird fake tweet. Well, uh, that's an encouraging thought. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it does make a difference when kids are the victims. Uh, and, and there's a lot of interesting reporting that has come out of it. Like, uh, I, I don't think I even put it aside, but in the rush of information that was coming out of it, somebody took a look at the numbers and said, you know, there have been more kids shot. I don't know whether they meant just in school or what, but more kids shot than cops shot on the job. And, uh, you know, when we were still wringing our hands over what the Uvalde police were and weren't doing, uh, and I guess we're still doing that too. But uh, yes, it's a very bleak uh, uh, landscape for the kids these days. And uh, I guess that's what changes minds in Florida diners, after all. So, okay, let's wrap it up for today and, in fact, for the week. Uh, All right. Happy June weekend to everybody. Thanks for coming by. It is June, and that means that the hearings are coming up. The public hearings on January 6th, where J. Michael Lutig is going to testify. All right. So we got that to look forward to. Uh, We'll build up to it, and then after we're off the air, they'll probably start. I hope they wait for us. (laughs) Thanks, Greg. See you next week. All right, welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Dead Roots Radio. There's, uh, as I said before, much to cover and much to get to and uh, no time to get there. Um, I wanted to clarify for the audience, uh, where did it come from, this idea that Grassley actually had a possible excuse to duck uh, culpability in whatever case might develop from investigating the Eastman and now Cheeseboro memos. And the answer is from a pretty good source who should probably, you know, be given the time of day here on something like this. Ira Goldman, who we quote all the time, KD by proxy, uh, who is himself something of a Senate procedure expert, though, well, I was going to say this doesn't have a great deal to do with Senate procedure, but really, I guess it does. Uh, And I saw him objecting yesterday. Uh, Maybe I should sift through his timeline to see whether he did it more than once. But um, as people were coming to the realization that uh, this memo could possibly implicate Grassley, I mean, I came to the same conclusion, too. But I realized after reading Ira's... uh, tweets about the subject. I might have to go back and he may have scattered this throughout his timeline because he's always talking about at any time, any given time, a great number of things. But um, I realized that uh, I had in mind that Grassley had tweeted himself from his own, own account. I mean, he's a kind of a prolific, if weird, tweeter. And I thought he had tweeted out that he didn't think that Pence was going to be on hand on January 6th. And so, therefore, I guess the conclusion is that he was supposed to be in the chair at that point. And I think Brian Boitler also kind of picked up on that. And I saw Ira 
taking him to task and saying, you know, are you are you making this mistake too? And I don't know, I'm trying to sort through his timeline, but it's very difficult. But he, he was pointing out, all right, well, I'll scroll back to uh, at least what I did put away. He's asking uh, Roll Call, the newspaper, to take down their January 5th, 2021 misreported tweet about Grassley. He's saying Grassley did not say, and he didn't tweet it himself. He was quoted as having said, I mean, it's as good as anything else. If you're quoted here and then Roll Call or anybody else who hears him say the thing tweets out, here's what Grassley just said. I mean, it becomes part of the canon if Roll Call, which is supposed to be a trusted source for this kind of news, says that we just heard, our reporter just heard Grassley say that VP Pence is not expected to be there and that he or somebody else might be presiding. That's true. It's true that Roll Call said that they heard Pence say that thing. The question is, did, or not Pence, but Grassley say that thing. The question is, well, in the first instance, did Grassley say that thing? I think we can, ordinarily we can take their word for it, but sometimes there is a misunderstanding. And a reporter either misses the first part of the conversation, which is essential context, or hears it but doesn't understand it, or you are thinking about the proceedings of January 6th in certain terms. I mean, you're coming with the question or the expectation that you're going to be discussing who's going to be presiding over the joint session on January 6th. And... Somehow the conversation steers to something else. It is plausible that Grassley is either asked the question or gets around to saying, all right, well, or somebody says, okay, so uh, whatever happens, happens on the floor on January 6th. The Republican senators are saying some of them are going to object to the Electoral College certificate from Arizona. What's going to happen then? And the answer is, of course, that the joint session can't do any voting. They can't make any decisions about what to do. So the joint session has to dissolve and the Senate goes back to the Senate side and the House resolves itself into the House and each chamber votes on what to do with these electoral certificates, which ones to count. And, and uh, then they reconvene if there's agreement on which ones to count. So it may be, in fact, the case that at some point the conversation shifts to Grassley is talking about what happens after they split up and go back to the Senate. Will Pence, as vice president of the Senate, preside in the Senate over the question of whether or not, of which electoral college certificate, if indeed to make it into the hands of the clerks, which one from Arizona should be accepted? And Cheeseboro's memo calls, I guess, for Pence not to preside, to recuse himself from it, because it's a direct question of whether or not to count the one that has his name on it or the one that has uh, 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 Kamala Harris's name on it in the VP slot. And I don't know, for some reason, they're thinking about shielding him from the political backlash and that maybe Grassley as Senate President Pro Tem should preside. It is possible. Now, Ira's pretty convinced of that. And he asks Roll Call, could you take down your January 5th, 2021 misreported tweet about Grassley? He says Grassley did not say he'd be presiding at the joint session. He was talking about presiding over the Senate. And that's the quote, over the Senate. It was your reporter's mistake, not Grassley's. That is an interesting possibility, but it is minutia to some extent. But the tweet in question here, January 5th from Roll Call, new Iowa Senator Charles E. Grassley, the Senate president pro tempore, says he and not Vice President Mike Pence will preside over the certification of electoral college votes since, quote, we don't expect him to be there. That's the famous thing that we all latched on to. And then, uh, I guess, following that, Roll Call says, Grassley said he will listen to debate 
and that it would be really wrong for me to say I have my mind made up. Grassley's office clarifies that he was meaning to explain what would happen if Pence had to step away during Wednesday's proceedings to count Electoral College votes. Every indication we have is that the vice president will be there, Grassley's office said. Now, that was the clarification they offered on January 5th, which was taken as backpedaling from the plan wherein they say that Pence was not expected to be there. So they, they, they seem to have caused a panic with that. And so they backpedaled and Grassley said, no, 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 we have every reason to believe he will be. Uh, what I meant was that I would preside if Pence has to step away, like if he has to go to the bathroom or gets an important phone call. That seems implausible. I don't believe that that's what he was really talking about. But that's not what Ira says he was talking about either. And Ira includes this clip, I guess, for, is this maybe from Roll Call's reporting, the act, not the tweeting, but their actual column. Senator Chuck Grassley, Republican of Iowa, said he would preside over the U.S. Senate debate surrounding the disputes of the 2020 election results if Vice President Mike Pence does not show up. Now, I guess what I would point out here is maybe the key word here, and, and this this may be the reporter's misunderstanding, the word here, debate, indicates that there's something wrong. Because remember, I've told you, and we just hinted at it a minute ago, there is no debate, and there is not supposed to be and can't be any debate in the joint session. The joint session's rules simply don't allow for it. There's no debate. There's no voting. There's simply, we're here, and... We are opening the certificates and announcing that they appear to be uh, authentic and in regular form, announcing the results and having the tellers added up. And then at the end, they say, here are the results and they announce it and they say X, Y, Z person is elected president uh, and uh, the other vice president and that we should notify uh, each house and the, and the, the president of the election of the next president. There's no debate. So when it says here, Grassley said he would preside over the U.S. Senate debate surrounding disputes. Um, yeah, it sounds like he's saying, oh, I'll preside when the joint session dissolves, when the Senate reconvenes back in their chamber. What are we going to do about Arizona I might preside there. He suggested, the column continues, Pence was not expected to attend, but Grassley's staff later said that that was a, quote, misinterpretation and that Pence was expected to be there. Now, there may be a second misinterpretation. There may, may have been that Pence's office uh, called and asked, maybe because they knew what was going on and they weren't sure exactly what they were going to do about it. They wanted to know, well, if Mike Pence has to step away, if the vice president is called away for whatever reason, who would preside? And the answer, I mean, the, they should have been able to assume that the answer is the Senate president pro tem, but maybe the parliamentarian's office or somebody else told them, yeah, probably Grassley at that point. And I guess that maybe they were trying to decide whether or not they trusted Grassley enough, and uh, as a result, they might have said, all right, well, what sorts of things could make you step away? Phone calls? Well, just tell them I'm busy. So hold all my calls, and what else? Going to the bathroom? Um, if, if for whatever reason he believes, if I step away, this whole thing could go spinning off into crazy land. I better not step away. Maybe the phone call is, who will take my place? Is that someone dependable? Or do I need to wear a depends, I guess, is the other the other option. I don't care what happens with my bladder. I'm staying. So go to the store and get me some depends undergarments so I can stand there and preside no matter what. Because Grassley is crazy. But they, he probably heard Grassley and said, eh, all right, well, I'm probably pretty safe. But maybe somebody should call Grassley and ask him what he thinks about this whole memo. Or not. And then we can figure out whether or not I really have to worry. So there's more to the column. He agreed, uh, or he suggested Pence was not expected to attend. And it might have been then that they said, I don't know, somebody asks questions about that. And Grassley says, we did get a call about what happens if the vice president's not available. So maybe he isn't going to be available. Well, anyway, the point is, if he's not, then I'll preside. Are you saying he's not planning to be there? 
I don't know. I guess so, because he called and asked. That's unusual. And then he said that thing. That gets put in the news. The vice president's office calls Grassley again and says, what the hell are you doing? What are you telling people I'm not going to be there for? I'm going to be there. I was, just, But you, you asked, what if you're not? I, I was just asking, what if? Just asking. Go back and tell him I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. It isn't, so you changed your mind? No, I, didn't. I never said I wasn't going to be there. I just wanted to know what would happen if I wasn't. That's all. Okay, it's unusual, but fine. I'll go back. And so he goes back and he says, yeah, misinterpretation. The misinterpretation was, I thought he said he wasn't going to be there, but he really wasn't asking anything like that. He was just asking what happens if. But I think there was a second misinterpretation in which people said, aha, so Grassley says he would preside if Pence has to step away from the Senate session. But everybody's focus is on the joint session and Pence is supposed to preside over that. So isn't he really saying, what if Pence isn't there? Won't the Senate president pro tem preside over that? And by the way, I'm not 100% certain that if the vice president doesn't or can't show to preside over the joint session, I'm not entirely sure who it would fall to normally. Like you would say, all right, if the Senate president isn't present, then the presumption is that the Senate president pro tem takes the chair or the Senate president pro tem's designee takes the chair. That's the rule for the Senate, though. Is that the rule for the joint session? I don't know. I mean, because quite honestly, uh, the next highest ranking constitutional officer in the building or in the in the hall at the time of the joint session is probably not the Senate president pro tem, but the Speaker of the House. It is possible that if Pence doesn't show for the joint session that Nancy Pelosi takes the gavel. That's a possibility. I don't know. It, or it may be, well, this right belongs to the Senate. And so we go to the next in line in the Senate. Why? I don't know. I'm not certain whether that is the rule or not. I don't know if it's ever happened. Uh, let me read the rest of this snippet that Iroh was focusing on, though. On Wednesday, Congress will meet to formally count the Electoral College votes after they were certified by the states last month. At least 12 GOP senators and dozens of House Republicans say they intend to object to the Electoral College results as those votes are read state by state in a joint session that begins at noon on Wednesday, noon central time on Wednesday, uh, 1 p.m., I guess, where it's actually happening in the East Coast. During an exchange with reporters on Tuesday, Grassley was asked how he plans to vote. And this, too, uh, of some interest. Now, how do you plan to vote? Where is he going to be voting? In the Senate, not in the joint session. No voting in the joint session. Well, first of all, I will be, if the vice president isn't there and we don't expect him to be there, I will be presiding over the Senate because that's where the debate is. According to a transcript of his remarks sent by a spokesperson, Grassley serves as the president pro tempore of the Senate and will preside over any portion of the debate that Pence does not attend. Here's, the, you know, the way the mistake gets made. Yes, he would preside over any portion of the debate that Pence does not attend. But the debate won't be in the joint session because it can't be in the joint session. He, the reporter is talking about the Senate session, but might not realize that that's a different thing. And that's the problem. So Grassley serves as Senate pro tem, Da, 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 but Grassley expects Pence to be present on Wednesday, according to his spokesperson. So two possible areas of misunderstanding there. And uh, I don't know. So I guess if you're trying to say, though, it only becomes important if you say, well, the fact that Pence or that Grassley says on January 5th that Pence might not be there means that he's had some he's been given some reason to believe he wouldn't be there. And he had been. There was some question, but I can imagine a range of questions, some innocent, some not so much, from the vice president's office that might lead you to believe that he wasn't going to be there. When in fact, he was just trying to find out what happens if I have to go to the bathroom, which honestly is a dumb question, but it, it is, it's possible that Pence, by this point, is aware of what they're trying to do and is very skeptical. He may still be seeking counsel from Dan Quayle, which is also highly questionable, 
but he ended up getting the right advice on that. What should I do if I'm asked to do this? And I guess a good follow-up is, well, if I have to go to the bathroom, do I have to you know, stand there and, and pee in my pants so that America doesn't have its democracy stolen, if that worries me? Or can I trust that if I go to the bathroom, uh, whoever takes the chair at the time won't give away the store? Or are they, are they empowered to? In other words, are they going to be like the lieutenant governor of Idaho? What's her name? McGee? 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 I can't remember. I remember that we couldn't pronounce it right. But um, anyway, uh, that lunatic, right? If the every time the governor of Idaho leaves the state, she starts issuing executive orders. What if I go to the bathroom and t and Grassley uh, is prevailed upon to issue some order or call a vote or in some way that he wasn't supposed to? Or what if they don't give the gavel or he agrees to give the gavel away and his designee is Lindsey Graham or somebody else who will do something crazy? Uh, I could see where that might come up. That's the only way I guess that I could see them getting to that confusion um, about uh, initial confusion uh, in Grassley's office or uh, in Grassley's head about whether or not the vice president is going to show up. So, you know, it, it's a thing. It doesn't necessarily convict Grassley, which is fine also because that isn't necessarily what we really wanted to get out of this information. The, uh, the, the memo itself is of some interest, and maybe we could read a little bit from that. Politico made a big splash in publishing the thing yesterday. Oops, and I see it jumps straight out of pocket. Let me open that one up differently. Um, but also see if I can grab Kyle Cheney, who was tweeting about this uh, at some length yesterday. And uh, I guess deserves a little bit of attention for having dissected this situation. Let me go to his original tweet in his long thread. He tweets yesterday, New, remember when a judge determined one of John Eastman's emails was subject to the crime fraud exception to the attorney-client privilege? Do you remember that? I remember it being discussed, but uh, I'm not certain I remember his actual ruling on it. But you may recall Eastman has his emails subpoenaed and he says, you can't have this one because attorney client privilege. And the judge says, well, you know, there are exceptions to attorney client privilege. And one of them, the one you never want to get yourself caught up in as an attorney is the crime fraud exception. If the communication in question that would otherwise be considered privileged because it happens between an attorney and his client is in fact about a crime that's being planned by the by anybody really, but by the client or whoever, and that uh, the attorney has reason to believe that it would implicate somebody in the commission of a crime. Uh, in that case, it's not privileged. You lose the attorney-client privilege because it's more important that the criminal justice system get access to the communication that would prove intent to commit a crime than it is to, you know, preserve attorney-client privilege. We don't want to privilege discussion of criminal activity and plans for, for doing crimes. We want officers of the court, the attorneys, to uh, honor their ethical obligations and say, oh, I can talk to you about all lawful operations. I can discuss the crime you committed in terms of uh, whether or not we, how we can defend you from it or, or reframe the issue such that although you're guilty, you could be convicted of a lesser offense. That's all fine. It's new crimes going forward. If you're saying, well, what I'll do is I'll kill all the members of the jury or the families of all the people in the jury, and then they won't convict. Well, at that point, they probably would convict you, but I'll threaten to kill them, and then they won't, right? That's a new crime. You can't say, well, I told my attorney that, so he can't, that's privileged. No, that's not privileged. they it, you would generally assume that everything you say to your attorney is privileged, but the crime fraud exception is one of several things that will destroy that privilege and allow us to get a hold of it. Well, that happened to John Eastman. One of his emails was, according to the judge, the, essentially 
the discussion of a new crime that they proposed doing, and the fact that he was speaking to his client doesn't help to shield the document. So what was in that document? Well, as it turns out, in that email was a December 13th memo to Rudy Giuliani that was just made public in new court filings, and then we can read it. And it's here for us to read. The memo, uh, Kyle continues, authored by attorney Kenneth Cheesebro, remember we were debating over how he pronounced his name the other day, described what he called the President of the Senate strategy, an effort to convince Mike Pence to assert control of the January 6th count of electoral votes. He's quoting here from the memo, which I'll hold for now, because we might want to come back and read through the whole memo and dissect it bit by bit. I'll take a look at it over the break and see whether it's something we can fit in. Cheeseboro's memo lays out a day-to-day -day plan of action, beginning with January 3rd, with hearings by Senator Graham. A Graham spokesman emphasized that no hearings were ever held, but declined to address whether Graham was ever approached about this strategy. And I guess... The strategy is at that point, uh, it's still a Republican Senate. January 3rd, they've sworn in the new members, newly elected members of the Senate, with the exception of the two from Georgia who are still involved in a runoff, as I recall. And so uh, it would have been possible at that point to call some emergency hearings of the Judiciary Committee and Senator Graham would have arguably been able to take the gavel for that and call those hearings himself and lay the groundwork. The plan was for him to lay the groundwork for the idea that there was enough fraud or enough question out there that Arizona and however many other states um, should have their electoral college votes thrown into question and that uh, maybe this is the part at which they say, well, if the Judiciary uh, Committee is holding these hearings and can raise enough doubt, then we can give instructions to the clerks and the secretary's office that says, all right, Arizona's stature is in question. You're going to have to. We demand, as your bosses, that you put both the fake and real certificate from Arizona in that box. Maybe this is the plan to get those certificates uh, handed to the vice president. Now, Kyle continues, on January 6th, Cheeseboro recommended that Pence attend, but recuse himself from the actual count, allowing a senior senator like Chuck Grassley to take the gavel. This would keep his hands clean from the fight about to ensue over electors. Um, we'll read the memo and read it a little more closely, but here we have to wonder, okay, does Kyle Cheney, is he reading it closely enough? Is he getting the point? Is it the case that Pence is being asked to recuse himself from the count, that is to say from the presiding over the joint session and not the Senate session that results from the question and then dissolution of the joint session to resolve the question of what to do with Arizona's ballots and other states that might object. So you wonder whether that was written correctly in the memo, reported correctly. And, you know, there's every chance that Cheeseboro gets confused too, as between the joint session and the Senate's session when the joint session dissolves to answer some of these questions. Cheeseboro then argued to let the chips fall. No one could predict what SCOTUS would do, and Trump could still very well lose, he said. But he said the effort would be worth it, and could even result in an unexpected outcome like Pence becoming president, which I guess it could happen. And I mean, that's, I guess, if we're talking about uh, coming up with an electoral tie and throwing it to the House of Representatives to choose the president, perhaps. Maybe we'll find out upon closer reading of the memo, which I guess we can do because we're at the end of Kyle Cheney's thread, but we're also running up against our break and perhaps we should just hold that memo 
for afterwards. There's an awful lot to talk about here today. I got this. I've got a great suggestion on an article to read from our good friend Darwin Darko, who sends something along that actually he read, apparently, on his own podcast. I suppose if worse comes to worse, and I just can't fit this thing in either today or tomorrow. I mean, well, we can wait until next week, too. But it's a good time to uh, say, well, you could always hear Darwin reading it and commenting on it along the way. And I, I, I briefly thought maybe the thing to do here is to ask his permission. Can I go and download your podcast and, you know, take the part where you read this article and just run it as a, you, you know, as one of your submissions to my podcast? But he didn't, he, he didn't suggest that himself. Maybe he wouldn't be opposed to it. I don't know. But at any rate, uh, but a very interesting article uh, suggesting that what is needed in the gun violence area is a national memorial to gun violence, maybe even specifically to school gun violence. I don't know, uh, but uh, an interesting suggestion. It sounds like a powerful article, and he suggested we give it a look. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see. I'm still sort of uh, looking through the timeline of Ira Goldman here. Um, and, uh, oh, okay, I guess this is uh, one of the exchanges he has with others on this subject. Yesterday, uh, Hugo Lowell, as uh, Greg brought to our attention, tweeting about this uh, new memo, and pointing out here that, um, right, so a uh, new Trump lawyer, Kenneth Cheeseboro, said on December 13th memo to Giuliani that Pence should recuse himself from running the electoral count and hand the gavel to a senior GOP senator like Graham. Recall that Grassley said on January 5th that he didn't expect Pence to preside. That's what came to mind. Uh, and let's see, Helen Kennedy a uh, 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 frequent citation, I think, on the show, and a blue check mark type of person, uh, former newspaper reporter herself, saying the memo actually names Grassley. And then Ira chiming in. Grassley did not say he would be presiding at the joint session. He was misquoted by roll call. And here's the screen cap and link <clears throat> to one of his earlier complaints about this saying Roll Call reported it wrong. When Grassley made his statement, it was only about the Senate when it would meet separately to consider objections, not the joint session. Even then, as we know, Pence presided over both. Uh, and it was here's some reporting by an Iowa paper on the question. And he's much clearer in the more extended quote that they give to him. I will be presiding over the Senate. Now, Helen pushes back and says he did say it. He was quoted by several outlets. His office later tried to clarify, but that is not a misquote in any interpretation. Ira is then saying, he said, as president pro tem, he expected to be presiding over the Senate. Why? Maybe because that's how it was done in 1969 and 2005. The only two prior times the Senate had met separately to resolve an objection. Right, we made mention of Al Gore presiding over the electoral vote count when he was vice president and running for president 
in 2000. But at that point, the Senate never, uh, the, the joint session never dissolves into separate House and Senate sessions. So he never has the opportunity to preside over the Senate. But an interesting historical point in 1969 and 2005, when the, uh, I guess, occasions upon which the joint session did find reason to dissolve and send the Senate back to its chamber for debate and a vote. Uh, in in those instances, there was a vice president who was then president of the Senate who was on the ballot that was being, about which questions were being asked about the Electoral College votes, and they recused themselves from presiding over that debate. So that's kind of interesting. So the only two prior times that the Senate had met separately to resolve an objection. Plus, for context, note Roll Call's second tweet. And this, uh, again, quoting himself, uh, talking about Roll Call tweets. Ira here saying, here's a good indicator that Grassley was talking about presiding over the Senate. If he'd been talking to Roll Call about the joint session, why would he mention listening to the debate? The Electoral College Act bans debate there. Debate, making up your mind and voting, happens in the House and Senate separately. Now, looking back at the Roll Call's second tweet that he's talking about, that's the one where Roll Call says, Grassley said he will listen to debate, right? And it would be really wrong for me to say that I have my mind made up. If he's listening to debate, it must be the Senate. Ira then goes on to say, as for you saying he was quoted by several outlets, I've not seen any other press outlet say what Roll Call said, i.e. claiming Grassley said Pence might not preside at the joint session, except when they were repeating Roll Call's claim. And that's true. That happens pretty frequently. If one authoritative source gets it wrong, lots of other sources will rely on that source and likewise get it wrong, very often because there aren't people out there with enough specific knowledge of the you know the minutia the fact that there isn't any debate in the joint session and that is a tip off that he's not talking about the joint session uh they're just not going to get that elsewhere and besides roll call they're the paper that covers congress they know what they're talking about we'll take their word for it even when they're wrong roll call he says claimed grassley said he expected pence not to preside at the joint session but the article you, Helen, linked to doesn't even mention that. It says Grassley said he expected Pence not to preside over the Senate. Then says Grassley's staff clarified that, i.e. about the Senate. And let's see. Uh, yeah, Helen comes back with uh, a screen grab from the Iowa Capitol Dispatch. During an exchange with reporters on Tuesday, Grassley was asked how he plans to vote. Well, first of all, I will be, if the vice president isn't there and we don't expect him to be there, I will be presiding over the Senate, according to a transcript of his remarks sent by a spokesperson. This must have frustrated Ira to no end because he's saying, yeah, it's right there. Again, it's right in front of your face. I will be presiding over the Senate. And people forget that, oh, yeah, no, that's a joint session, not the Senate. And he points that out. Yes, but Hugo Lowell endorsed Roll Call's claim that wrongly put Grassley's comment in the joint session context, i.e. running the electoral count, when the reporting in your screen cap is about presiding at the Senate's session. I have been saying what your screen cap says. So, yeah, I mean, I think we've straightened that out. But you could see how that would confuse people and how they'd want to stick to their guns about that. But it's really not necessary to stick to your guns about it in order to implicate Grassley, because who cares about Grassley, quite honestly? I mean, if you get him, great, bonus. Um, and there's reason to, to think he might have had a tip-off, but, uh, you know, it's not absolutely necessary. So let's take a look at this memo, and I guess also I will say uh, one of the other things besides reading the article that uh, Darwin had suggested to us, I, I, I I'm considering today or tomorrow, depending on our timing, probably tomorrow because the, the memo will take up all our time today, to return, uh, considering returning to yesterday's discussion of the, um, the fake news story from uh, where? Chicago, suburban Chicago, about the supposed separate grading systems 
right, for black and white students that was basically just a conflation of what had actually happened. But there, but there's more to that story. And the real main part of the Substack expose on it from Don Moynihan was about the network of websites disguised, you know, basically fake news websites disguised to look like real ish news sites. It's meant to confuse people between opinion and factual journalistic reporting so that they could take it and run with it uh, when they, you know, and willfully misunderstand what was going on in this school district and then make this fantastical claim. And people say, what? That can't be real. Show me a link. And you show them a link that looks like a news site. Well, there's lots of confusion out there. I mean, you can't just make up a news site, right? Well, you're not supposed to be able to do that. But of course, how many times on this show have we discussed uh, real news articles that are being reported by real journalistic outlets, but were confused about the source because two of the major newspapers in a single state work together as a consortium online. And so you get reporting from, you know, Arizona online, and that's not the name of the newspaper. It represents the Arizona Republic and whatever other, I don't know, whatever it is. I can't think of two newspapers in Arizona for whatever reason, because I'm not from Arizona, but very frequently that happens that two or more newspapers, uh, you know, there's an NJ.com that has reporting from the star ledger, which is the Newark paper and the Bergen record, which, well, it's from the Bergen County, which is different and, uh, you know, still northern New Jersey. But uh, and I'm sure they cover southern New Jersey stuff, too, from one of their other South Jersey papers. But it's not entirely clear which newspaper is doing it. Taking advantage of that, if you uh, report your news from, you know, Illinois State Law News or whatever, are you a consortium site or are you just some? crap that somebody made up in their basement that's hard to tell and as it turns out uh don moynihan illustrates in his sub stack that that's in fact what's going on here and further uh one davy alba a bloomberg technology reporter points out that he wrote an expose in the new york times previously about this very case and their use of these networks of fake-ish, I guess we will say, news sites. It's not quite just fake news, completely fake, but outrage factories to be sure. So something to look forward to either later today or tomorrow, but probably more likely tomorrow because I would like to take a look at Politico's reprinting of the Cheeseboro memo and just get some sense of, What's going on there? Read the Trump world legal memo that a judge ruled was likely part of a criminal effort to overturn the election. Don't lose sight of that fact uh, that they lost out on the attorney client privilege there because crime fraud exception. An attorney, it says in subheader here, sketched out a plan for then Vice President Mike Pence to halt the certification of Joe Biden's victory. If you blinked, you missed it. It begins... The January 6th Select Committee last week publicly released a long-hidden memo that a federal judge previously determined was evidence of, quote, likely, unquote, felonies by Donald Trump and attorney John Eastman. The document, it's a December 13th, 2020 email from a little-known attorney who had been advising Donald Trump's legal team, Kenneth Cheesebro. And there's a link here to the email. Is that actually, yeah, uh, I guess this is the printout of the email itself as Exhibit A in the filings of the January 6th committee in court. So let me continue reading on here. So it's from Kenneth Cheeseboro. He sent it to Rudy Giuliani, sketching out a plan for then Vice President Mike Pence to halt the certification of Joe Biden's victory on January 6th, 2021. He dubbed it the president of the Senate strategy. And before I begin on it, I want to point out, I did read the beginning of the memo, and I think this is kind of a funny thing. Um, it, it, it begins, well, what it really is, is it's a, here an email to John Eastman, forwarding to Eastman the email that he wrote to Giuliani 
that contains the outlines of the memo. Now, in his email to Giuliani, I think this is the funny part here. I just wanted to let you know how close we came to uh, not having any of that stuff documented at all. Uh, here, listen to this. Uh, he begins in this email, privileged and confidential. Dear Mayor, that's Giuliani. Unfortunately, as mentioned in my text, I lost the several page memo I had nearly finished due to a reboot of the hotel computer or on the hotel computer. Rather than rewrite it now and further delay, here are some of the quick notes on strategy. So he actually wrote up a detailed, had almost finished writing a detailed memo on all of this stuff. And then his computer crashes and he has to reconstruct it. He ends up rewriting the bulk of the memo. I mean, he's still making the strategy, but that's pretty funny. What would have happened? How would history have been different had the dog eaten his homework after all? Well, anyway, I don't know whether that gets mentioned in the Politico piece here, but I want to say that before I read on. Cheeseboro's memo became public last week as a little noticed, little noticed exhibit in a legal battle between the January 6th Select Committee and John Eastman, who conferred with Cheeseboro about that last-ditch strategy to delay or prevent the certification of Biden's election. U.S. District Court Judge David Carter described the memo in his March ruling as perhaps, quote, the first time members of President Trump's team transformed a legal interpretation of the Electoral Count Act, unquote, the act, or rather the law that governs the transition of power, into a day-by-day -day plan of action. Carter wrote in his opinion that the memo likely furthered the crimes of obstruction of an official proceeding and conspiracy to defraud the United States. He ordered it released to the select committee under the crime fraud exception to attorney-client privilege. Wow. The strategy, the plan offered by Cheesebro depended on the existence of competing slates of presidential electors in a handful of states where Biden won the popular vote. In fact, just a day after Cheesebro sent his memo to Giuliani, Pro-Trump activists gathered in several state capitals and signed documents falsely claiming to be the true presidential electors from their states. Then, Cheeseboro's strategy required Pence to, quote, firmly take the position that he and he alone is charged with the constitutional responsibility not just to open the votes, but to count them, including making judgments about what to do if there are conflicting votes. That's a bit further than the, well, I mean, it's in contradiction to what the Electoral Count Act says. But remember that he's actually arguing, as Armando has argued in the past, that the Electoral Count Act itself might be unconstitutional uh, under the 12th Amendment, I believe, which, uh, which he references when he's saying, well, you can't um, force the vice president to preside over the joint session or over the Senate for that matter, because his role in the, uh, in the count is, uh, well, his role everywhere is, is prescribed by the constitution and you can't assign additional constitutional duties outside of the constitution, even if it's in the electoral count act, which sounds very important. It is after all, just an act. Anyway, um, let's see, are there are a couple other things that, uh, this prompted in my mind, but, um, yes. Oh, right. I wanted to point out that, uh, let's see, uh, where would I have stowed this? Somewhere in my tweets and retweets is a note from frequent Twitter correspondent Sponson, who pointed out that at some point uh, in recent months, ah, here it is. Sponson sends this tweet from Amy Rivers, a journalist for the Iowa starting line that uh, is from April 12th. This is audience member, it's a video, audience member pushes Grassley on why he didn't vote to send the election results, quote, back to the states after Trump loss in 2020. Grassley pushes back. There wasn't an alternative set of ballots that came in, which is of some interest because it indicates uh perhaps, that it was Grassley's belief that had alternative ballots been presented, 
that would have been an excuse for him to do what Trump wanted, but that they didn't come in. I mean, they did come in, but they didn't get presented for consideration, I guess, from, I don't know, they did get presented for consideration from some states. Let's see. Uh, there's more to the tweet thread here. Here's quotes, I guess, transcripts of the exchange. The question, what is the real reason for the problem with this? Oh, supply chain <laughs> and what's being done to correct that? Grassley answered the first part. So this is really just a video documentation of his appearance at a town hall meeting of some kind in um, when? April. Um, but it, 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 it's interesting, an indication that there wasn't an alternative set of ballots that came in. Like, it, had he been satisfied with the veracity of the alternative certificates, he might have changed his mind. Or just sort of confirming the importance in this scheme of getting those papers onto the floor. And if papers that don't meet with Grassley's approval don't make it onto the floor, then he wouldn't do it. There were some who would be willing to do it, and the record is complete on who voted yes and who didn't on accepting the fake ballots, uh, the fake electoral count certificates. Uh, but as Greg was pointing out earlier, the real danger is what if uh, what Grassley really means here is there wasn't an alternative set of ballots that bore the governor's signature from those states, because for whatever reason, those governors you know, if you ask the Trump people, they chickened out and they wouldn't sign the fake one. Doug Ducey signs the real certificate from Arizona. And what could be the case that Grassley is saying, if Ducey had signed the fake one, I would have voted to count that. That's the danger of Doug Mastriano as governor of Pennsylvania. He says, I will sign a fake one if necessary. And then we know what Chuck Grassley and probably others like him will do. Well, the governor's signature is on it. What did you want me to do? Investigate? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the governor's word for it. Well, here a Democratic governor has signed for Biden. Yeah, well, that one's a fraud. You know, give me Terryanism will kick in and take over at that point. All right. Jumping back to Politico. Uh, we were just reading about the strategy and Cheeseborough's strategy requiring Pence to say that he and he alone is charged with the constitutional responsibility, not just to open the votes, but to count them, which I don't think the counting is discussed necessarily in the Constitution, but the Electoral Count Act says how they'll do it. Tellers, and they're the ones doing the counting. I'd have to check to see if there's no mention of the tellers in the Constitution. I don't know. Anyway. For right now, other elements of importance, according to Politico here, January 3rd through 5th, what was happening? Cheeseboro suggested that members of the Senate hold hearings in the days before the January 6th session. There aren't very many of those days, though. In particular, he wanted Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, then chair of the Judiciary Committee, to focus on Pence's power to count electoral votes. A Graham spokesman emphasized that he held no hearings on this subject at the time. His office has declined to say whether any of Trump's lawyers approached him about the plan. On January 6th, Cheeseboro suggested that Pence should immediately recuse himself from running the electoral vote count, citing a conflict of interest and hand the gavel to Senator Chuck Grassley or another senior Republican senator. Now here, too, are we talking about confusion or was this the plan? Here we'll have to read the memo itself. But it's not entirely clear why. I mean, the, 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 the historical examples that Ira showed us, reminder, those are for vice presidents recusing themselves from presiding over the Senate debate over what to do with disputed certificates. There's, I don't think, any historical precedent for the vice president handing over the gavel, recusing himself from presiding over the joint session. But as I understand it, Cheeseboro's memo tries to make a constitutional argument for that recusal. So January 6th, Cheeseboro suggests Pence recuse himself, hand the gavel to Grassley or some other senior Republican senator. Then that senator would lead the count but refused to accept any electors in the states that Trump was contesting. Instead, the senator would contend that if those states wanted to be counted, they had to return or rather rerun their elections, engage in more litigation or have their legislatures appoint new electors. 
In other words, they wanted to put someone in the chair who would be cooperative and would say there is an opportunity to change the electoral votes from this state. Safe harbor doesn't work. It's not a real thing. And independent legislature theory says that the legislature can not only name electors, but can do so at any point, have as many bites at the apple as they want with an election, without election, pre-election, post-election, whenever they feel like it. Highly dubious. But he's saying it anyway. I think at this point they're under five robes theory. If we can get five robes to say yes, then this ludicrous understanding, quote unquote, understanding of the Constitution that no one has ever espoused before or since uh, is what that's the law of the land. You didn't know it, but that's only because we didn't get the five robes before to tell you that it was the case. But I always knew it. Now, post January 6th, here, Cheeseboro essentially suggests to let the chips fall. The Supreme Court might step in and overrule the Trump gambit or sidestep it by declaring it non-justiciable. In other words, the political question doctrine, right? But he said even trying and failing would be a worthy attempt and could resolve uh, in unpredictable ways, such as the selection of Pence as president. The select committee's view, trafficking by Trump allies in these theories prove they planned to repeatedly violate the Electoral Count Act to impose their fringe interpretation of the law and keep Trump in power. House counsel Doug Letter wrote in last week's filing. Cheeseboro was also behind arguments for Trump allies to send competing, quote unquote, competing slates of electors to Congress, creating the very controversy those allies said was necessary for Pence to assert control. That's a very important point, too, right? Pence needs to assert control because there's confusion. Where'd the confusion come from? We asked people to create it. On what basis? No basis. We just needed confusion, so we said, let's make some. Eastman's view. Eastman said in his court filing on Tuesday that the document could not possibly be the basis for a criminal act. He noted that neither he nor Trump authored or received the December 13th email and that Cheeseboro explicitly said the goal was simply more investigation and attention, not necessarily to reverse the outcome. Hmm. Loose ends, Cheeseboro and Grassley did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Okay, so that doesn't even get us to the reading of the memo, which is something I'd like to spend some time on at least. Well, maybe we'll get back to that tomorrow unless events overwhelm us because I'd like to see what it is that he actually says about Grassley and where he should and shouldn't preside. Well, let's read it at least up to the end of the show. First of all, here it begins from Kenneth Cheeseboro to John Eastman. Um, draft two with edits. Oh, I did a very rough email on December 13th. This is now January 2nd that he's speaking. Oh, this is interesting. He sends it on January 2nd and then I guess resends it on January 4th. In fact, the very first thing he says on January 4th, here's the December 13th email with the 12th Amendment at the end. The January 2nd email saying, oh, I did a very rough email on December 13th, which redacted, requested on behalf of the mayor, that being Giuliani. A lot of it is irrelevant at this point. The end discusses the originalist view of the 12th Amendment, which may or may not comport with what uh, we've heard Armando argue about it. Here's the December 13th email, which begins, Dear Mayor, unfortunately, I lost my original text in the hotel computer crash, right? Rather than rewrite it now and further delay, here are some quick notes on strategy. I have not delved into the historical record Vice President Pence's counsel has and seems totally up on this, and I'm sure there are many other lawyers who can add a great deal, redacted in particular. And I'm writing this with reference to, I guess, three law review articles I happen to have taken with me, which I attach as references. They're uh, cited here, but never mind those for the moment. The bottom line is, I think, having the president of the Senate firmly take the position that he and he alone is charged with the constitutional responsibility not just to open the votes in bold, but to count them in bold, including making judgments about what to do if there are conflicting votes, represents the very the best way to ensure, one, that the mass media and social media platforms, and therefore the public, will focus intently on the evidence of abuses in the election and canvassing, 
and two, that there will be additional scrutiny in the courts and or state legislatures with an eye toward determining which electoral state slates are the valid ones. Okay, so he's just supposed to assume this power and that will help create the confusion they need. And uh, I guess he thinks, uh, and I think this strategy can be carried out with surrogates of the vice president and president, with them standing mostly above the fray, urging only that there be real scrutiny of what happened in this election and that they're willing to live with the result as long as there is a serious look, especially by the state legislatures, at what happened there to ensure it will never happen again. All right, time for us to roll the music and get out of here. I think having the president of the Senate use the defensible claim that he is in charge of counting the votes as leverage to obtain that needed scrutiny would be worthwhile even if it couldn't ultimately prevent the election of Biden and Harris. The Republicans used this argument in 1877 as leverage and with it managed to get an election commission created which elected Hayes. Republicans should use it again. Here is the chronology of how things would play out if there is a serious effort to employ the argument that the president of the Senate counts the votes. Between January 3rd and 5th, I guess that's when he wanted there to be the hearings. Uh, let's jump quickly to January 6th. The House and Senate assemble for the opening and counting of the votes. The theme that the counting of the votes will proceed on a strict textual originalist basis proceeds when Vice President Pence steps up to the podium to cause the first break with the procedures set out in the Electoral Count Act. The Electoral Count Act states that House and the Senate shall meet in the House on January 6th at 1 p.m. and the President of the Senate shall be their presiding officer. The Vice President will announce that he will not serve as presiding officer for two reasons. First, Congress cannot by statute impose duties on either the President or Vice President beyond those set out in the Constitution. For example, Congress could not by statute require that the President throw out the first ball on opening day of the baseball season. And that's just like this, don't you think? Hmm, a little From suspect. NetworksRadio.com You have been listening to Kegro in the morning with David Waldman. It's an interesting approach. He also says, even if Congress could mandate that a vice president should preside, Pence will take the position that he shouldn't because of the conflict of interest. That's only, I guess, to get him to be above the fray and set it up for someone else to take over. The question is, he doesn't resolve whether it necessarily has to be the Senate pro president pro tem. Sorry. We'll see you tomorrow.